Friar Bacon's Folly, The Cultural Poetics of the Brazen Wall in Early Modern England. The relationship between magic and nation building in Robert Greene's 1589 pastoral comedy, The Honorable History of Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay, has an interesting critical history. Critics have been divided over how we are to understand Friar Bacon's failed attempt to raise a brass wall around the English Isle. Elisa Hopkins depicts this attempt as a crowd-pleasing gesture, one resonant with contemporaneous English fears of foreign invasion by sea. Given that the Spanish Armada had occurred only a year prior, we initially find much reason to concur with Hopkins's argument. However, an opposing school of thought has been put forward by Barbara Traister. Traister argues that the play serves as a didactic text, one which argues that there is no need for, but rather danger in, England's with wall behind brass walls. We too find reason to see Traister's argument as persuasive. The Prince of Wales, Edward, does in fact choose to marry Eleanor, Princess of Castile, suggesting that intermarriage between ethnic groups is a politically superior alternative to the enforcing of strict borders. What's more, Edward is only able to accomplish this union between England and Castile by rejecting his earlier affection for Margaret, who is stylized throughout the play as a typically English beauty. In attempting to harmonize these two viewpoints and further our understanding of this often neglected text, we hope to put forward a resolution to this critical debate by first seeking to answer a different question. Out of all of the possible ways that Friar Bacon could have sought to have protected England, why did he choose to do so with a brazen wall? As Tracer has pertinently remarked, England is already walled with the ocean, a point made abundantly clear in the play by King Henry himself. Early on, Henry tells the Castilian king that his dominion is ringed with the walls of old Oceanus, and that promontory cleaves show Albion to be another little world. In this way, to put a wall around England would seem to be something of a superfluous gesture. And if we are to question the existence of the wall, we must also interrogate its materiality. There seems to be no clear reason why the wall must be made out of brass. We propose that this problem is made slightly less puzzling when we consider Green's brazen wall in its cultural and literary context. Green was not the only English author during this period to utilize brass walls in his texts. For example, Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus seeks to wall all Germany with brass, just as Edmund Spencer's Merlin did intend a brazen wall encompassed to compile about Kermarden. However, neither Faustus nor Merlin managed to successfully erect a brass wall, something which is consistent with this narrative arc that we see presented in Green's play. For both Spencer and Marlowe, as for Green, the function of the brass wall is to be an impenetrable defense, a defense whose properties can only be obtained by means of sorcery. These authors were likely drawing this idea from a larger classical tradition, which had associated brass walls with both the otherworldly and the supernatural. As the classicist D.E.W. Wormel has argued, bronze, which was translated into English as brass until about the 18th century, was closely associated with magical practices in the ancient world. It was thought that in a brass wall, the magic of the bronze would enhance the magic of the circle made by the ring wall and would constitute an impenetrable defense. And so in Hesiod's Theogony, we are told that roundabout Tartarus runs a fence of bronze, and in Pleo's Critias, we learn that the outermost walls of the mythic city of Atlantis were covered with a coating of brass. In the Odyssey, both the palace of Alcinous and the floating island of Aeolus are all walled about with brass. While Green likely did use brass walls as a means of evoking an impenetrable supernatural force, as in the classical association, there are also other associations that remain to be discussed. We argue that for early English writers, the brazen wall must have also harkened back to England's imagined lineage from Brutus of Troy, the first mythical king of the Brythons. According to legend, Brutus was the reputed descendant of Aeneas, and it was this Brutus who founded the city of London, titling it Troy Novant, or New Troy. For many early English writers, English patriotism became intimately linked in the collective imaginary with the idea of a noble Trojan heritage. One way in which this heritage was represented symbolically was through the image of the brazen wall, interestingly enough, which was understood to have actually existed, to have historical existence, and to have served as a system of defense for the ancient Trojans. As D.E.W. Wormel suggests, the source for this myth was likely the product of a careful study of Horace's odes, which speak of a Morris Aneus, or brass wall, which had encircled the ancient city of Troy. 
To our mind, the fact that the Latin word for bronze, Aeneus, was only a single vowel slip away from the name of the great Trojan hero, Aeneas, could have only contributed to the strength of this association in the English mind. In this regard, the Trojan past is intimately linked in the English collective unconscious with the idea of a heroic national identity, one which calls back to the classical adventures of epic and one which could be represented by a poetic use of brazen walls. Green was not the only writer to have invoked this association. Speaking of Constantine II, Edmund Spencer tells us as follows. That Roman monarch built a brazen wall, which mote the feebled Britons strongly flank against the Picts that swarmed o'er all. The wall that Spencer refers to here is the Picts Wall, more often known by the title of Hadrian's Wall. Now, that Hadrian's Wall was made of stone and not brass would have been clear enough to anyone who had been far enough north in England to have encountered its 73-mile-long perimeter, but here we propose that Spencer has revised history to make the Roman involvement in the affairs of the Britons more grand and more heroic. Spencer does this by calling to mind Roman descent from Aeneas of Troy. Here, it is Aeneas's Roman progeny who come to connect the island to its classical past. This is all done by means of a brazen wall, a wall which helps to establish both a geographic and an ethnic border. In a like manner, we propose that Green uses the brass wall as a way of connecting the English political project to this legendary Trojan heritage. In attempting to raise a brass wall encircling the island, Friar Bacon is going to aim to fulfill Brutus's legacy by making England into this Troy Novant, or New Troy. Now, nevertheless, if patriotism and lineage were all the brass wall were to signify for an English audience, we would find ourselves in almost complete agreement with Hopkins' argument, which is that the creation of the brass wall was designed to play off anxieties about foreign invasion by sea. But Green not only deploys classical discourses associated with brass walls, but also the biblical discourse. In doing this, Green establishes Bacon's attempt to fence England with brass as not just a classicizing gesture, but as a gesture which is symptomatic of something larger. In this case, it is of Bacon's sinful pride, or hubris, and a pride which must be repented of before the play can conclude. Thus, in speaking of brazen walls, the biblical text often deploys the standard association discussed earlier, the association in the classical world, by which the brass wall is a proverbial expression for impenetrable means of defense. We can see this, for example, in Jeremiah 15.20, where God tells the prophet as follows, I will make thee unto this people a fenced brazen wall, and they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee to save thee and to deliver thee. Now, the biblical text is also going to use the breaking of brass walls as a mean by which to criticize the foolish pride of man. In Psalm 107, we hear that the Lord hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron asunder. Similarly, in Isaiah 45 too, God promises to go before Cyrus and break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. In both of these passages, the breaking of the brazen wall signifies the liberation of God's chosen people from the Babylonian captivity, but it also signifies their liberation from the bonds of sin, which are likened unto iron and brass. If we focus on a literal reading of the biblical text, what is of most interest to us here is the idea that Babylon, like Troy, was girt with brass walls, an interesting point of connection between the biblical and classical sources. For example, Herodotus writes that Babylon and the circuit of its walls have a hundred gates, all of brass, with brazen lintels and side posts. This idea is similarly well attested to in Calvin's commentary on the Psalms, where he writes that Abidinius, as quoted by Eusebius in his Preparatorio Evangelica, says that the walls of Babylon did in fact have brazen gates. Here we note that tradition has Semiramis as the Babylonian queen who lines the perimeter of the city with these brazen walls. This fact is, interestingly enough, brought up in the text of Green's play, when Bacon rather arrogantly claims that the brazen walls framed by Semiramis, carved out like to the portal of the sun, shall not be as that rings the English strand, from Dover to the marketplace of Rye. Now, that Semiramis was the wife of Nimrod, the ruler who had attempted to build the Tower of Babel, is here a relevant detail. In the biblical text, the earthly rulers who seek to shield themselves in in, with brass are deemed arrogant in the face of the Lord, the Lord who in an instant can cut down both the tower and the walls. If on the one hand Green has Bacon establishing a noble Trojan heritage at a sensitive moment in English history, Green on the other hand also has him playing at Nimrod. Bacon's project is thus deliberately Faustian. He tells us that he will strengthen England by his skill 
that if 10 Caesars lived and reigned in Rome, they should not touch a grass of English ground. Now here, the English political project does not just bow its head reverently towards Trojan ancestry. Rather, it seeks to utterly surpass the glory of Aeneas and his descendants. Given the context of Bacon's subsequent humiliation and his concluding repentance, it is clear that this is a gesture meant to be seen as both vain and arrogant. When Burden says that Bacon roves a bow beyond his reach and tells of more than magic can perform, we are meant to see Bacon's raising of the wall as an act of folly, rather than solely as an act of patriotism by which he may defend the English patrimony. Burden's speculation as to Bacon's true motives are thus correct. When Burden asserts that Bacon thinks to get a fame by fooleries, the audience can see a clear mirror in Bacon's lament at the play's conclusion. Ah, Bungay, my brazen head is spoiled, my glory gone, my seven years' study lost. Now, while an earlier generation of critics have noted the text's didacticism in this regard, there has yet to be a substantial critical discussion about how the text has structured Bacon's repentance. Though it is true that Bacon repents for his folly and for his pride, we would also like to note that something else is going on structurally in the text. Bacon's repentance is used so that the audience may see the marriage of Edward and Eleanor, and thus transitively of England and Castile, as a corrective gesture against the pride implicit in Bacon's attempt to raise a brazen wall around England. For it is at the wedding ceremony that Bacon shows us the link between the brass wall and the union of England and Castile. While Bacon is repentant for the follies of his youth, he is also joyful that this royal marriage portends such bliss unto this matchless realm. When asked by King Henry to specify the exact nature of this bliss, Bacon indulges Henry and the audience with a concluding bit of prophecy, telling them what shall grow from Edward and his queen. Thus his prophecy begins. Here where Brute did build his Troy Novant, from forth the royal garden of a king shall flourish out so rich and fair a bud, whose brightness shall deface proud Phoebus's flower and overshadow Albion with her leaves. Now, confused, Henry is going to note that this prophecy is mystical, but the audience is well aware that Bacon has foreseen the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Much as Bacon had sought to do earlier with the raising of the brazen wall, this prophecy also harkens back to the legend of British descent from Aeneas, as can be seen from his invocation of both Brutus and Troy Novant. Moreover, as the early modernist Brian Walsh has also noted, the trope of invoking prophecy is itself a callback to the prophetic writings of Virgil, a frequent topic of study in the later commentary tradition. Lisa Hopkins, speaking of the role of the prophecy in early modern English drama, notes that it often packed a political punch. For stories of the classical past, particularly those which were centered on the supposed founding of Britain by descendants of the Ur colonizer Aeneas, were often seen as authorizing an expansionist future. What is most interesting about Bacon's prophecy here is not just the repetition of this Trojan invocation, but also that the marriage of England and Castile are here recast in the same patriotic garb that the raising of the brazen wall was once cast in. For strangely enough, the end in mind is neither as self-serving nor as reactionary as Bacon's initial end was, for Bacon's desire for personal advancement had made itself adjacent to an isolationist political project. But from the marriage of Edward and Eleanor will flower Elizabeth, the pride of England. But this pride in flowering is the product of a nation of people who have opened themselves up to foreign power, rather than of a people who have walled themselves off from it. Thus, once the prophecy has finished, King Henry refers to the couple as the glorious commander of Europa's love, suggesting a move beyond provincial politics of isolationism. The closing conceit, to be sure, is a metaphor of conquest, but we also must note that we have now moved from the image of the wall to the image of the wedding feast. In the concluding lines of the play, King Henry declares to the foreign powers present that they shall have welcome, a line which echoes Edward's own first lines to Eleanor, where this word welcome is repeated four times in the span of just six lines. Thus, in Bacon's failure to erect a brass wall around England, Green highlights the inability of national myth-making to fully adjust to the often globalizing realities of statecraft in the early modern period. In the place of inoperative divisiveness, Green puts forth a pragmatic politics of unity, by which intermarriage and acculturation, even with England's traditional enemies, accelerates both political gain and national grandeur. The honorable history of Friar Bacon and Friar Bundy ends not with the erecting of a border, but with a command to furnish out the boards. For Prince Edward 
As for green, it is by the marriage feast that one may truly conquer. For King Henry himself will say in the play's concluding line, it is thus that England glories over all the West.